Open to Mark chapter 12. Thank you for turning our eyes to the risen lamb this morning, Marla. I mentioned in our pastoral prayer a few minutes ago about uh, the need and the loss in Sullivan, Indiana. And thanks to your generosity through our benevolent fund, we were able to provide a uh, $3,000 offering to go towards some of those rebuilding efforts through Samaritan's Purse this week. So know that your gifts are going to help people who are displaced and bring them the good news of Jesus at the same time. So we thank God for that. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone where they passionately declare something and it betrays a certain level of maybe ignorance about their existing that seems a bit astonishing? It's like a person declaring that there's no such thing as a nervous system in your body while using the nervous system to declare that. Or maybe, love you teenagers, a teenager saying to his parents because of a certain rule that's been imposed in the house, you hate me, after 13 to 18 years of love. And I just read where it costs an average of about a quarter of a million dollars to raise a child now, too. So there's just a lot of love, kids, that goes into that parenting. But sometimes we don't appreciate the ground that we stand on, and we lack a little bit of self-awareness. This and rationalizing something without all of the information can lead to that kind of conclusion, a false conclusion. But we do the same thing as adults and sometimes with even the biggest questions in life. On Resurrection Sunday, we're faced with one of those kind of non sequiturs that we hear bantered about often. And it, is, it happens even though we walk around in a, a world that is stunning, a world full of vibrant color and creativity and wonder set in a universe that we can't even comprehend and someone says Christ rose from the dead and people look at you like you believe in fairies or something. And if we think materially in a closed system with only natural laws and processes it works, the resurrection doesn't make much sense, does it? But if we add the fact that the person involved in the resurrection was the same person who called those natural laws and processes into existence through his infinite power and his almighty word, then raising one body from death doesn't actually seem like that big a jump after all, does it? In this resurrection morning, we come by God's providence to a question raised by the Sadducees to Jesus about the resurrection. And we're going to see both their lack of self-awareness in this most basic assumption about who God is in their relationship to him, and we'll also be compelled by Jesus to see the power of God in the resurrection. So look with me at Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 18. And the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow, and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and when he died, he left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. We come to this question from the Sadducees, and you kind of get the idea that they're not really being all that serious with Jesus. They are mockingly challenging him. Now, the Sadducees were a group that were politically powerful during Jesus' day. They sat on the Sanhedrin and they formed an opposition group to the Pharisees. They were conservative, but they were also rational and sensible, so they styled themselves. Especially because of the way they approached Jesus, we see that they had a little bit of 
A little bit of arrogance as they approached him with this reductio ad absurdum. They wanted to show that a belief in the resurrection was ridiculous, laughable really when you work it out. So they dreamed up a scenario that was based on some popular fantastical religious writings from the day and they brought it to him. Now they believed in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Old Testament and nothing more. They didn't hold the prophets or the wisdom writings or any of that as authoritative. And so they brought him this challenge from Deuteronomy 25. And there a man whose brother died without offspring was required to marry his uh, brother's widow and raise up offspring. And so they picked a big family in this scenario, a family with seven brothers, right? And they went through the scenario with him. Now, if everybody comes to life again, whose wife is she, Jesus? Ha! See how your logic breaks down, Jesus? This resurrection thing is ridiculous. Little did they know, they sound kind of like the teenager who says, you hate me, (laughs) to their parents when it comes up with a rule. It's, It's actually the other way around. It's absurd. When we see the unending mercy and infinite wisdom of God that compelled him to come to mankind in the first place and make a covenant and rescue people, they were betraying their ignorance of the entire enterprise of God with mankind. And so Jesus responds to them in verses 24 through 27 and highlights this fact. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Now that's a pretty deep rebuke right there. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong, Jesus said. So Jesus corrects their misbelief with a profound look into the kind of relationship that God enters into with people. And the thing that they had missed, just a couple small things, the meaning of the scriptures and the power of God, right? (laughs) They were the ones who were actually absurd. And so Jesus is going to, as the word of God in the flesh, he's going to, to call us to look at these things, the scriptures, And the power of God. Now, what better way to do that than to hear it from the lips of the one who has created us? And so Jesus explains that the resurrected state differs from our current state. People in the resurrection, which Jesus is presupposing, obviously, don't marry. Jesus is saying even what we say in our marriage vows, which is, till death do us part, right? Death is the dissolution of the marriage vow. So why no marriage in heaven? Well, think about it for a second. What's the point of marriage on earth? It's a wonderful relationship of unity between two people and God designed it in his command to bring forth offspring. And you don't need any more offspring in heaven because everybody that gets into heaven lives forever. There's no need to perpetuate the race and so there's no need for marriage. It doesn't mean we're not gonna have beautiful, eternal close relationships, but there's just no need to have more kids. So people in the resurrection don't marry because they don't die. Jesus says, but they're like angels in heaven. So angels exist and they don't marry. This is also another point of the Pharisees. If you go to Acts 23, when Paul's brought before the Sanhedrin himself, he raises this question and he says, the reason I'm being brought before you today is the issue of the resurrection. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees get into a big argument because the editorial comment in Acts tells us Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection and they denied the existence of spirits and angels. And now Jesus is even addressing that with them, but are like the angels in heaven, he says. The Sadducees were functioning more like naturalists and materialists than those who believed in a living God. And Jesus was peeling back the curtain to show us a bit of a heavenly mystery of what it looks like with him in glory. And we see a powerful and active, alive kingdom full of people who don't die, surrounded by angel armies that God's commanding. And so Jesus brings in the scriptures now and shows them 
the scriptures, the same Moses that they had quoted in the law encountered the living God who is the God of the living. Instead of quoting the prophets or the wisdom literature that they didn't believe in, Jesus went straight back to Moses. The book of Exodus written by Moses about his life, God's interaction with Israel. In the passage about the bush, that's the burning bush, right? Moses had recorded the words of God there. In Exodus 3, 2, it says that an angel of the Lord, again, an angel, appeared to him out of the fire in the bush. Moses, Moses is shocked, right? He sees a bush that's on fire, but the bush isn't being consumed. So he stops to look, and he's even more shocked when he hears the mighty and majestic voice of God speaking to him out of the bush. And here's what God says to Moses. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. What we hear here is that Jesus is not just telling us that God's giving us his name, which he is, but and he's not just giving us a title for himself, which we can rightly call God the, the I am, but he's revealing something about himself. And he's revealing something about himself in relationship to those he enters into covenant with. He is the living God. He doesn't die. He's always been. He is I am without beginning and without end. Now you notice something when in the scriptures when you read and, and the words are repeated over and over again, you should stop and pay attention that there's a reason for that. There's an emphasis that's happening. So he says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. The point is not that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob believe in God. The point is that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that's what he's conveying to them. He didn't just come to do nice stuff for them. He came to be their eternal God, to rescue them. And what sense would it make for God to be this wonderful God to them and then them just go into the chasm of death and be separated from him for eternity, right? The Sadducees believed in a form of nihilism or, ex, uh, or, or, or their lives being extinguished. Now man had earned and welcomed eternal death because of rebellion against God, but God defeated that rebellion. He entered back into the storyline of mankind's death in order to fix that problem. And so Jesus makes this declaration. Here's the son of God saying it as clearly as can be said. He is not the God of the dead. He is God of the living. The resurrection exists because God isn't the God of the dead. If you are his, then you have life. And so we have, quod erat demonstrandum, QED, right? Point proved by Jesus. But of course, when it comes to proving a point, logic only goes so far, right? But something you can't argue with is your own resurrection, right? And so Jesus puts the exclamation point on God as the God of the living by on Resurrection Sunday rising himself. That is what every Old Testament saint looked forward to, the coming of the king who would save them by his life. And what we look back to as believers in Jesus Christ, that moment when Christ rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And Friday, we took a hard look at the painful death of Jesus. He died that death not for himself, and not in vain, but he died it for us. His body on the tree. And there as we, as we made those marks on that cloth and as we remembered that our shame and our guilt and our condemnation was placed upon Jesus on the cross, our separation from God, we were reminded that we cannot bear our own sins. We can't carry their weight. Only Jesus could do it for us. And yet we witness Jesus on the cross bearing the weight of billions and billions and billions of sins on his mighty shoulders. He paid the debt there on the cross. 
And the debt was paid in full. That's why he cried out, it is finished. The Lamb of God has taken away the sins of the world. And how did he prove that what he was doing was true and effective? How did he prove that he had overcome death? How did he prove that he indeed held the keys of death and Hades? As we heard this morning in our scripture reading, he didn't just say it, he did it. He rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. So what does it look like for you and me not to fall into the same trap as the scribes and the Pharisees to, to not mistake the power of God and to, to misunderstand or just not be aware of the scriptures? God being God of the living means that he ensures he works out our life as people in covenant with him. The resurrection of Christ is the power of the death-defeating life of God for us. Jesus' resurrection is the power of God. That's what Jesus is talking about. John 10, 18, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again in order to raise myself again. This is the charge I've received from my Father. Our God has the power of life and death in his hands. So let's take the statement a little bit further. The resurrection is the power of God, but the resurrection is the power of God in us, the scriptures teach us. God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And so his resurrection power is our life now. John 11, 25 through 26, Jesus declared on the way to raise Lazarus from the dead. These words, he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is what God is doing by salvation through faith. He's uniting us to Jesus. If we have Jesus, we have the resurrection. If we have Jesus, we have the life. And his resurrection is the power of God for our life now, but it is the power of God for our life now to transform us as well. Romans 8, 10 through 11, listen as I read. But if Christ is in you, believer, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that incredible? The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ out of that grave is the same Holy Spirit that inhabits every single believer to give life to our mortal bodies. Now you and I despair, don't we, sometimes of our strength to be transformed, to be delivered from sin, to be victorious over Satan's temptation, to be victorious over our flesh, over our long-held habits of sin and maybe even our addictions. This passage is telling us that if we're to understand that the God of the living lives inside of us, the power of Christ is resident within our mortal bodies to give us death overcoming power so that through our own bodies, through our hands and our eyes, our mouths, God's power can transform us and give us victory. It's not just, come on, brother and sister in Christ, get your act together, right? Try a little harder. You know, you got it within you. No, it's, you have the power of the Holy Spirit within you. He can take that body and those hands and that mind and that mouth. And he can transform it from death to life. He could take your brokenness 
and your weakness. And by his power, he can make you into the image of Jesus. There's a reason for that. It's not just that God takes our bodies and then pours in the Holy Spirit. That would be good. It would be really good. But it's even better than that. It's even more enduring than that. It's even more, it's even more close than being filled with the Holy Spirit or just filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason we have the Holy Spirit is that God has united us to Jesus. Colossians 2.13 says, And you who were dead in the trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You who were dead, right, in sin, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. Do you hear that? That says that the resurrection of Jesus is not just something that we look back on and celebrate but the resurrection of Jesus is a reality right now for you and for me in Jesus. Because you were raised with Christ and I was raised with Christ when he came out of that tomb. Because we have been united to him. It's as close as our very personhood. It's as close as our spirit. It is, it is part of us now. And that's the picture of baptism. That's why baptism is such a beautiful celebration. And as we rejoice with those who will be passing through those waters later this morning, I encourage you, stick around for second service to celebrate with them. We are declaring, yes, I was buried with him. And I have risen to walk in newness of life because of the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a mystery, isn't it? We didn't see any of that happen. But the scriptures and the power of God are that those who are in covenant with him have that reality as the basis of their lives. And so Paul prayed in Ephesians 1.18 for the Ephesians to figure that out and to work it out. And listen as I read. It says, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know, so he's, he's working on them. God, would you please open their minds so that they don't miss the power of God, that they don't miss the scriptures the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? That's the confidence of our future resurrection and our eternal reward. And what is, now listen to this part, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward those who, of us who believe? Do you hear that? The immeasurable power, greatness of his power. Now, according to the working of his great might, and he's gonna tell us where this immeasurably great power comes from that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come. So you wonder how much power is God operating you inside of you with by the power of the Holy Spirit? He just told us it's immeasurably great power the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and the same authority that seated him at the right hand of the Father is the same power and the same authority that now is inside of you, brothers and sisters. And so now we can declare with all of our brokenness and with all of our weakness, because we are united to Christ, we are inhabited by immeasurably great power because of the resurrection that makes every day an experience of resurrection day for us. So this Easter, we're not just remembering that Jesus rose from the dead, follower of Jesus. We are, we are remembering that we rose from the dead with him. That makes the resurrection our hope in our life. That's the hope of your marriage. That is the hope of your parenting and your children. It's the hope of our church. It's the hope of our communities. It's the hope of our workplaces and homes. It's the hope, the workplace, or the, it's, it's the hope of our workplaces and our dying city, our dying nation, our dying world. Following Jesus is not just a set of morals or a better religious decision or something that's just gonna work out better for you if you do it than another option that you have. It is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of hope or despair in our brokenness. 
It's a matter of coming alive out of sin or being trapped in it and bound by it. And our hope and faith is not in our obedience either, brothers and sisters. It's in the resurrection life of Jesus, which makes it so that our hearts turn back to him with glory and hope and confidence. So looking back through the cross, that's what it means to comprehend the statement. He's not God of the dead. He's God of the living. He's God of the living. I wonder if you don't wanna say those words with me this morning. He's not God of the dead but God of the living. Will you say that with me? He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Isn't that something to rejoice in? Now, it might be easy for us to look back on the Sadducees and say, wow, <laughs> you rationalists, materialists, you guys missed the whole point. But we get it. But I wonder if on a more fundamental level, we too might have missed the point of the resurrection of Jesus. I wonder, brother, sister, friend, do you know the power of God? I don't just mean, do you know about the power of God? Do you know the facts of the theology? I'm saying, do you know the power of God? Do you know the power of God to face your sin? Do you know the power of God to face your temptation? Do you know the power of God to transform you? Do you know the power of God in your marriage and as a parent? Is the power of God active in your home? Is the power of God active in your, your community? Is the power of God active in your workplace? Is the power of God moving you? Jesus told Nicodemus, that when new life happens, like being born again, that there are evidences of that new life. We see that in believers when they come to life in Christ. There's a hunger for the word of God and a concern for people who are lost and don't have salvation. And all of a sudden you care about, about your relationship with God and, and whether or not what you're doing is, is pushing you away from the one who's saving you and rescuing you or not. Maybe this morning there's been a coldness that has entered into your relationship with God, a deadness that is there, and it concerns you. Maybe you're at a place in your walk where sin is more powerful, and it's holding you captive. Maybe there's no stirring within you any longer. There's no transforming power at work within you. Paul knew that believers needed to know how to put that kind of resurrection power into everyday life. And so he explained it in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If you've got your Bible, I want you to open there. Colossians chapter 3. I'm just going to draw out two points so that we don't walk away and miss the power of God in the scriptures for us. Paul writes, if then you have been raised with Christ, which has happened if you're a believer and the power of the Holy Spirit is within you. And here he says, this is what happens. If you've been raised with Christ, this is what you do. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And here's the second thing. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. And here's the reason why. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You've been united to Jesus and your life is there. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So the two things he gives us are seek the things that are above where Christ is and set your mind on the things that are above. To seek Jesus and to seek the things that are above means that we devote serious effort in our desire for Christ. 
You say, well, wait a minute, Ben, you just said it was the power of the Holy Spirit within me that does all this, right? This happens by osmosis, and I walk out of here, and now that I know it, my life is transformed. Well, no. God uses means by which he conveys his grace to us, and one of those means is our cooperation with the working of the Holy Spirit. If you want Jesus, that's because God's doing something inside of you. That's already God at work. And you saying, yes, Jesus, I want you, and I'm gonna think about it, and I'm gonna devote serious effort to following you, that's you responding to God's work within you. He says something interesting where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You think, okay, what does that mean? How do I just do, am I just supposed to think about heaven all day long and harps and clouds and stuff, or what do I do with that? I think what he's saying is, is that you're realizing that your whole your whole existence and your whole eternity is wrapped up in your unity with Jesus. Everything's wrapped up in Jesus and you see that is so central to you that you want to set your affections there. You're gonna seek that. That's the thing you're after in life. Not money, not your reputation, not your comfort. You're seeking Jesus because that's where your life is. So you seek the things that are above it's like Peter, when Jesus asks in John 6, he, Jesus said, eat my body and drink my blood, and everybody said, Jesus is crazy, and they started leaving. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, what about you guys? Are you gonna go away too? Peter looks back at Jesus and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's what it means to seek the things that are above. You realize that's where it all is. And the second thing, set your mind on the things that are above. That means being mindfully of attentive to the things that are tied to Jesus. If you are struggling spiritually with coldness, your marriage does not have spiritual life in it, God's power is absent from your home. Your relationships are dead. Could it be that you're going about life more like an unbeliever than like a believer? Like a person who isn't united to the immeasurably great resurrection power of the eternal son of God? If that's the case, don't stay there. Fill your mind with and train your attention to the glorious truths of the gospel. You will see as time goes on that your heart will come alive. You will be transformed. Your joy will spring up where you had despair and your marriage and your parenting and your relationships, your community, your church. All of these things will come alive for you because they'll come alive with the experience of Jesus with you in them. The glorious truths of the gospel living themselves out in you. Jesus is calling us to not just know, but to experience those glorious truths that are taught to us in the scripture, that demonstrate to us the power of God, that are proven to us through the resurrection that God is not a God of the dead. He is a God of the living. And you may be here today as someone who's yet to entrust yourself to Jesus and you're wondering, can I trust what Jesus has said? <laughs> I want you to listen to Romans 1.4. It says that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What more proof do you need? Someone validates it by raising themselves up. You can go visit the tomb of all kinds of dead people and you know their bodies are right there, but you can visit a tomb that's empty where Jesus was laid and that resurrection declares to you that indeed he is the son of God. Satan doesn't hold the power of death. Sin doesn't hold the power of hell. Jesus holds the keys to death and Hades because he is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus offers you what he has. 
his life and his power, his healing, his forgiveness. And so listen to his words. He issued the call. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And so the question for you is, will you trust him? And will you entrust yourself to him? You may be wondering, what's my next step? What do I do if I want to follow Jesus? And the next step is to follow Jesus. To follow him. To take up his word. To commit to obey him. To confess your sins to him. To find his forgiveness. And maybe, maybe just maybe on this Resurrection Sunday, if that's what God's doing in your heart, you would open your mouth and you would tell that to someone else. If you're wanting to follow Jesus, our desire is to help you with that every step of the way. And so if that's where you're headed, that's what you want, come talk to me or one of our elders. We'll get you set up with someone to help walk you through the most amazing and beautiful and powerful journey that you'll ever have with Christ. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord Jesus, on this resurrection morning, we rejoice We rejoice not only that you rose from the dead to accomplish our salvation, but that you have brought us along with you, raising us out of death, raising us out of our condemnation because of sin and giving us a new life and an inheritance with you that never ends. And God, we thank you that you haven't done this at arm's length, but that you have done this through the beauty of a united existence for eternity with you. We thank you and praise you. We glory in and we entrust our lives into your care because of the great power that you have exercised on our behalf. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus, amen.